Greetings, booktube, and good morning. I'm making a terrible decision. I'm recording during early morning traffic. There is a highway right outside my apartment, so apologies if there are any really excited motorcycle sounds. Sometimes the highway trucks like to toot at each other. We will get by. We'll do the best we can. Um, I am so thankful to be able to chat with you folks, and I have been just struck by the engagement. Thank you so very much to everyone who has been listening, following along, and subscribing. It's an unusual feeling. I, a year ago, I hated the idea of video. I'm getting better at it. I'm getting more comfortable with the medium. As you can see, we have a new layout today as well, and I'll be changing a lot of my promotional materials around this new layout in the coming days. It all comes down to feeling more and more confident with the work, which takes time. And I have to say, when you have become skilled at a few things, it can be very frustrating being a beginner again at something else. Uh, it's something I quote-unquote enjoyed when it came to learning Spanish very much uh, via immersion here in Colombia. I certainly tried before I came to Colombia, but immersion is a completely different experience. There's a lot of embarrassment and humility that goes into the process of learning a language like any other skill. So, video, the idea of engaging with multimedia, I think will be useful going forward. But it's taken a long time to get over my skittishness the same way it took me a while to get over my skittishness. The first time I started posting it to, well, Patheos, which before my work at Only Sky, I was terrified because the audience suddenly grew. So I'm thinking about all of this in relation to Children of Doro, my Dostoevsky in Space novel, which is launching May 4 and which is already available on NetGalley. NetGalley, which is uh, most of you might not know about the differences in our lovely writing world, but in the publishing world, NetGalley is extremely important as a service that helps get your book get your book into the hands of reviewers, and uh, it's expensive for that reason. It's extremely expensive. It's around 500 U.S. dollars per book, which is the kind of pricing you can only afford. Uh, and should only afford, please, as an indie writer, do not throw your money um, into advertising. Think it's suddenly going to make a huge difference. But thankfully, SIFWA, sci well, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers um, Association, has a phenomenal program that allows indie writers to apply to have their books considered through SIFWA. They have a limited number of spaces that they make available and you pay a much smaller fee for um, the service and you get your book into the hands of more people. I have other places that I have used. I've talked about them on other lower quality videos, so I might go back, but I just wanted to celebrate that program. Thank you, Sifwa, so very much for making that possible. I don't know what the result's going to be. Maybe folks will read the book, which is exciting. Um, but maybe they won't. And this is something that comes to the main topic today, which is I want to talk about, uh, well, two of the issues that I've been moving through as this book publishes have been related grief about the fact that it's probably not going to be read in conversation with a lot of other work, which I would have loved for it to have been um, read in, in, in concert with. But if the work isn't traditionally published, it tends not to be considered for awards. It tends not to be considered um, as top reading. There's an idea that, oh, well, if a traditional publisher didn't want to invest in it, it must not be very good. And people will be nice. It's so great. Look at you. You published a book. You should feel very proud of yourself. But we do have a very odd and rigid way of thinking about um, merit. So I've been grieving that. And that ties into what we'll talk about today. The other part, though, I've been grieving in a way that's allowed me to, to rethink something that's been affecting me for, oh, I guess, about a year now, which is that when the book went to market, um, my brilliant agent did her best with a tremendous number of uh, mainstream presses, and quite a few they highly praised the world building, the writing. They said that I was an exceptional writer, one to watch, looking forward to the next, etc. 
And ultimately, they used this phrase. They said that they didn't know how to market it. And I, I know better than this when it comes to short stories because I have published short stories for years now. And so I've received rejections for years as well. Uh, but I took this one phrase too much to heart. And I kept we- it kept weighing on me, the idea of how can, you, how can you not market this book? What's the problem? And obviously, um, there is the fact that it is a Dostoevskian voice. We've talked about that in other episodes. Polyphonic narration is not an easy form for Western culture. Uh, Polyphonic narration being holding multiple points of view in tension and not giving a clear sense of um, moral uh, rightness to any one particular position. You're really holding many views together uh, and seeing a, a more holistic truth. But the other part that was weighing on me when I heard that expression over and over, we don't know how to market this, was thinking to myself, what are you talking about? We have tons of science fiction that has been informed by classic literature, philosophy, history, and science fiction and fantasy. So what on earth makes this one distinct? And this was my mistake. So I want other writers to really pay attention to this. Sometimes people will just give an excuse for saying no. And I obviously try to hold to the positive things they said, that the world building was innovative, extraordinary, writing was excellent, writer to watch, etc. But when they say that they didn't know how to market it, it's just probably um, a phrase that allows for a gentle letdown. There could be any number of things. Maybe they just had too many other works that they were more interested in. Probably it's that. And uh, you shouldn't get too caught up in little tiny expressions like that. I let myself get caught up in that. But I let myself get caught up in that because I would have loved for this work to have been in conversation with the wide range of work in science fiction and fantasy that is informed by our history, that is informed by our literature, that is informed by things that have come before. It's one of my bugbears with Western publishing right now, though, that there's so much focus on novelty that it's very difficult for other kinds of discourse to be presented confidently. We're not a very intellectual culture when it comes to our literature, and that's disappointing. That doesn't mean that the intellect isn't there. It's just that we almost feel like we need to downplay it. Like we just don't, yeah, you can be smart, just, just don't be too smart. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very strange phenomenon. So again, last year there were tons of works in sci-fi and, uh, and fantasy. Um, I think I've talked before about how uh, Becky Chambers' latest series, the Monk and Robot series, very quiet meditative pieces are very thoughtful and they engage in uh, a kind of everyday reflection on really important questions. We also have pieces like um, The Genesis of Misery by Neon Yang, which is a retelling of Joan of Arc in space. So again, it is possible to market these things because they are marketed. Done. And yet, I also do understand that anxiety. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an example. I'm going to also practice with my, some of my features here. I've got these all queued up so we can do some visual accompaniments here. Um, we're going to talk about one of the pieces that first highlighted for me how tough a time Western publishing has with literary discourse that draws from deep sources. This, if for those who can see the screen, is Ken Liu's The Grace of Kings. It's the first in his Dandelion uh, Dynasty series. And I don't know how many of you remember when it first came out. Now, Ken Liu is a very thoughtful writer and translator. Tremendous amount of work uh, out of China is only in Western hands because of how much work Ken Liu has done to promote it, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this piece had such a messy promotion. Do you remember this? Maybe some of you do. This piece was promoted as silk punk. The idea was you had to come up with a cool, hip, new subcategory of fantasy if it was going to count. Is this work silk punk? It is not. And 
that's been a complicated, fascinating conversation. Because just as George R. R. Martin used the War of the Roses in a particular era in European history to frame his major series, so did Kennedy use pretty much directly the early history of Chinese emperors and dynasties. And it is, to anyone who knows the Chinese history, pretty direct. Uh, like a, just the outlining of events as they happened, which is fascinating for a couple of reasons. When the book first came out and was promoted as silk punk in the West because it has to be this edgy new uh, kind of fiction in order to sell in the West, writers, readers from a Chinese context or Chinese background writers like, this is Chinese history. It's just Chinese history with a little bit of a fantasy flourish. I don't want to underplay it, but I'm trying to point out there were different responses, which was frustrating because it meant that to some it felt as though the book was only getting any kind of acknowledgement because people had thought that Ken Leo had made up this history, that he had invented all of this and he hadn't. Um, very much he was drawing from another body of history well known to many people in the world. And then come, comes the second wave of people in the West who discover this and start to think that because this book is drawing so directly from Chinese history, it's almost a ripoff, and it is inferior because it's not original, which again is a Western way of thinking about things, and not even a very new Western way of thinking about these things. We've had so many Arthurian legends replayed over and over and over in our literature. We have done so many works. Wolf Hall, which is we're getting a little bit off of my genre beat, but we do love reimagining history. The problem is, for some reason, inside science fiction and fantasy marketing, inside the promotion of this work, it was decided at some point that that wouldn't sell, that you couldn't market this work that way. You couldn't have a Chinese writer saying, I'm going to engagingly retell classic Chinese history for a Western audience that probably hasn't engaged with it before, but might find it very interesting. Nope, it had to be silk punk, which it is not. It is not punk, so. Um, these are the kinds of frustrating issues that highlight that something has very much changed in our culture, because we did have the capacity to have these deeper conversations. We just don't. And I'm gonna give another example of this, In this one's a personal bugbear of mine because I think this book is one of the most thoughtful pieces of philosophical sci-fi to go, have come out of our genre in quite some time. You need to be ready to be reading philosophical sci-fi. You need to know going in that it's not going to be the same kind of adventure ride that you're used to. This is not The Expanse. All of The Expanse is fantastic. I am mean, no, no shade to The Expanse. It's just something different and it's important. So Ken Lia translated um, Hao Jingfeng's uh, Vagabonds, which first published as two separate novels and then was merged into one in 2016. And to 2020, it came out in English. And again, it suffered from Western publishing. Western publishing <laughs> looks at this text, which imagines a, a world, a Mars, that has become a sort of scientific communist utopia and Earth has become a fully capitalist nightmare <laughs> in some ways. I'm being a little bit biased by saying a nightmare. The book is much more even-handed. So you have capitalist Earth and a scientific communist Mars and you have a group of students from Mars who have gone on a field trip, a little bit of an expedition to Earth and they're coming back. And the novel involves them exploring social contract theory and evaluating the world they grew up in uh, in relation to the world they've just experienced and reflecting on the differences and the similarities. And it's not just them. As they discuss these interesting insights, we are also introduced to many other characters. We have a visiting uh, film scholar, archivist, who is also as an adult engaging in the Martian way of being. For the first time, you have people on Mars who are not necessarily fully satisfied, always working towards improving uh, the system or acknowledging that they're going to be resigned to their lot in it. You have many subject positions. 
And so Western Publishing looks at this and says, okay, no, <laughs> too many subject positions, you can't do this. So how did they decide to pitch this piece? They decided, and I, I wrote a review for Strange Horizons if you want to read more about this, to pitch it as they would generic YA adventure revolution uh, fiction, which involves, okay, we've got this group of young people, so what if we frame it as this one young person is coming back from a world that she never knew, and it's going to change the way she looks at the world she always thought she knew. Is she going to be able to uncover the deep, dark secrets and stage a revolution that's needed in this communist state? So it's it's just, it's such a puerile juxtaposition that a lot of Western publishing constantly tries to affect newness, like saying, oh yeah, we need to make something edgy like silk punk. At the same time, there's nothing new about these kinds of YA um, revolution cycle stories. So we are very comfortable and set in our ways, and yet we keep wanting to pretend that we are constantly looking for and interested in the next new thing. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just settle into comfort with being part of a longer discourse, which is what happens in this book as well. You have a lot of classical philosophy and literature invoked among the characters as they discuss the world that they live in and uh, evaluate if it's the social contract they want to live in. The really wonderful, thoughtful work that is comfortable in its history. And I wish we were too, because we have a lot of it. There's no need to constantly lean into newness. Which is not to say, again, that uh, we are lacking for content. We have lots of wonderful writers and wonderful reimaginings of the world. I actually have notes here with me so I can make sure I don't forget too many things. There's so much. So let me take a look at my notes just to remind myself. Yeah, so one really important component of our negotiation with history right now, though, is a reimagining of history. And that usually involves a retelling of things to recenter persons marginalized in the original story. And so it's been very popular, extremely popular, to retell classic stories with a female-centered uh, perspective that might have been absent from the first. And uh, we can go to some funny, odd extremes. For instance, um, The Mere Wife by Maria um, Devana Headley, it reimagines Beowulf uh, in the 21st century, and it was nominated for the World Fantasy Award. It's fabulous, so it really it really pushes the boundaries of genre to, for inclusion there. But that also speaks to some of the issues, which I talked about in another video, is that commercial science fiction and commercial fantasy have excised us, have separated us from a deeper history of speculative fiction. Beowulf is classic literature. It also has fantastical elements by our understanding of the term today. But in, in, in the context of the time, difficult and, and different to imagine. I want to be very cautious about that. We'll come back to all of that when I talk more about the novel I'm now writing, the next one for the agent, which is um, Thucydides in Space, I glibly call it. And I, I'm only mentioning it here because Thucydides was famous for writing about this war, um, the Peloponnesian War, without invoking God's deus ex machina for everything. And so when we talk about histories of fantasy and speculative writing and their interaction with the world around them, it's important to remember that there were rationalists, atheists, people who didn't uh, believe in the same kind of mm, fantastical elements that a lot of others around them might have, or the mythologies that the others around them might have, or the religions that others around them uh, might have. So we have to be very cautious about suggesting that Beowulf was in a time when, you know, fantasy was just everywhere. Mm, uh, yes and no. Fantasy is everywhere today. We just have different words for it. So that's one of them. Um, another one, which is, I think, a little bit more directly in the science fiction and fantasy camp, um, if you can see on the screen right here, we have the Ballad of Black Tom. And uh, yeah, that's Victor Laval. Uh, I'm just trying to remember the year. Oh yeah, that was 2016. This is a slender volume, um, a little fun read. And it writes back on Lovecraft, 
who quite notoriously was inspired by a lot of racialized anxiety in the whole of his canon. And so a lot of people write back against his work to critique his original uh, prejudices or to flesh out the world um, in other ways. And this one is an excellent, delightful jaunt into that world which renegotiates with a lot of the same intensity, I would say, uh, his original concepts. So many people love the Lovecraftian universe that it's difficult to, to align it with the fact that this person, there's actually a game you can play online, who said this, Lovecraft or Hitler? If, if not, a, not, a, not a kind person but an influential one. And so these kinds of negotiations with our past can be quite useful uh, in helping us go forward. So let's see. Oh yeah, and of course, then there are ones that can be a little bit more on the side of joy. Oh, I forgot to have an image for this one. Oh, sorry. Okay, I thought I'd brought all my image files, so you're just going to have to imagine with the power of Google or whatever your search engine of choice is, Matt Johnson's PYM, P-Y-M, uh, which is my personal favorite in terms of pieces that are writing back against some of the problems of earlier fiction. Um, and I think it most acutely engages with historical fiction. In part, that's because it is tying itself to a whole tradition of other writers who were also responding to Edgar Allan Poe's The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. Um, this piece influenced Herman Melville, Lovecraft, um, and Jules Verne. And the piece involves an expedition that it, includes explicitly the idea of very, very, very black people, even the teeth are black, uh, living in Antarctica. And so Matt Johnson decides to just take this concept and run with it in a quite satirical and lovely meditation on the world as it was even 10 years ago, which almost feels quaint now, but it's, it's still quite pertinent. Uh, and what I find striking about this work, even though it's not usually talked about in relation to uh, Matt Johnson's Pym, is that he's not just writing back against Edgar Allan Poe, he's also tying himself to a long-standing tradition of early black science fiction and fantasy writers of the 19th century and the early 20th century who also wrote about black utopia, who wrote about imagining running away to form new colonies or the existence of other colonies outside of um, colonial pressures. Long before Wakanda, this has a long, long tradition of the idea of these isolated spaces or these better spaces. And so there's a lot, there's a wealth of historical intersection inside this piece which I think uh, makes it a very strong read. So I'm sorry that I forgot to put up that one. You can find the uh, image online. What else is there? Oh my goodness, yes. So we also have more recently pieces like this. Uh, I think it's Nivo, um, The Chosen and the Beautiful. And work like this becomes possible because year after year, many texts fall out of copyright. In this case, The Great Gatsby fell out of copyright. And this author was there and ready for it and was able to use the source material to inform a, a retelling, a renegotiation of many of the concepts in this world. Um, this fantastical retelling, there is definitely a strong fantastical element in it, involves a queer Asian um, protagonist, but the... The, the seamlessness and the lushness and the beauty of this work is very much this author's own, so the source material just allows for a kind of ideological backdrop against which this person can negotiate uh, quite a few existing ideas about the era and just flesh them out. So that's a really lovely use of conversation with past literature. Uh, yes, yeah, so before we go any further, I, w I don't want to neglect the work that presents its own philosophy. We have lots of work that is engaging with classic lit and classic history, but we also have work that is presenting its own arguments, obviously. And I couldn't choose an Ian M. Banks novel, I'm sorry. So I'm just going to say all of the culture novels do this. All of the culture novels deal with um, social contract theory, obviously, the idea of interventionist politics, technological utopia. Each book has some really 
challenging, thoughtful concepts about um, not only how we make better societies or could make better societies, but what happens after their construction? How does the hist history goes on after their construction? And especially if one is living in a context where not everybody is part of your culture, where there are delineations between your culture and others, how does that work out too? So wonderful, thoughtful ideas that play out in many books in some really inventive ways. Um, yeah, so I didn't want to choose just one. Maybe I'll come back to um, the culture series later. Uh, also, Ursula K. Le Guin, pretty much everything that she's ever written, but let's just choose The Dispossessed for now. Um, the Dispossessed is a dialogue, really, and I know people are, can be quite shocked sometimes to hear uh, about sci-fi that's not thoroughly action-oriented, but it exists in abundance. So it's quite ridiculous to see people um, try to suggest that we are all about lasers shooting up ships and so forth. The dispossessed imagines two worlds, just like, uh, like vagabonds. Um, one is a very anarchical utopia, and the other has more of the failings that we would ascribe to our world. And we have an individual from this anarchist utopia who has decided that he's going to try to bridge the gap between the two. And that involves bringing certain ideas to our culture. And it also means through that very intersection of ideas, reflecting on some I preconceptions of their own. So wonderful, thoughtful work uh, and experience. And if you've only heard of Ursula K. Le Guin in relation to The Left Hand of Darkness or Earthsea, which are also Wonderful books, do yourself a favor and read The Dispossessed. Uh, we also have this famous one, I can't, I can't not mention it. It's, it's quite fascinating because obviously Parable of the Sower, we've got biblical invocations, but it's, it is its own tale. Um, and it's also about walking away and constructing society. So it ties itself too to a long tradition of black science fiction and fantasy writers imagining leaving spaces and, and, and deciding how we build the next. Um, and it, as a result, it has a very fascinating conversation about the selection of better worlds in a, a climate nightmare, <laughs> not unlike our own, so perhaps Part of the reason this book keeps coming back is because it keeps becoming more relevant to our current society when we are all going to have to figure out how to walk away, but it's not always easy. Uh, more recently, too, again, so much literature that counts as science fiction and fantasy has been doing wonderfully thoughtful work. And truly, this one last year blew me away. It's a very small piece, and yet a I honestly, I think I will be coming back to it <laughs> uh, because it has so much. And so this is Olga Ravin's um, The Employees, uh, a workplace novel of the 22nd century. And I don't want to spoil it, so I'm not going to. Uh, I am going to suggest that it is a reading experience that allows you to think about the nature of self, what it means to be sentient, conscious, and how much of our sense of self, our sense of community, is formed by the spaces we inhabit, the things that inhabit those spaces with us, and uh, our notion of purpose, our notion of work. So, oh yeah, especially if I get to publish this on, I think May 2nd, it'll be the day after more, uh, World International, the International Day for Labor, so perfect read. Uh, to think about this month in that regard as well. But again, a very meditative work. It does have plot. It does lead to a very dramatic conclusion, but I don't want to spoil it. It's a record of testimonies from a bunch of different characters. I, I'm not spoiling it. It is a lovely way to think about subject position, which some of our best work does. Okay, so uh, moving on really didn't want to forget anything because there's just so much good stuff. Oh, I also want to give out a shout out, of course, to works like this. So I've been talking about classic literature, history, um, philosophy. The Sparrow includes theology in an important way. It imagines a first contact scenario between the Jesuits and a very alien species. And the idea here, even though it's the Jesuits who are going forward, 
it does indict all of us who might have a sense of overconfidence um, about the idea of what a first contact would look like. The idea of truly alien species with a completely different framework and, and, and social structure and biological set of parameters is something that's challenging for most of us. I think the lens of religion here is a good one to help negotiate that estrangement because there are a lot of presuppositions that go into these kinds of missionary missions and it's done with a lot of grace and a lot of delicacy here as um, the Jesuit mission makes a huge mistake, huge mistake, but for completely understandable reasons. Uh, also in this camp, again, as I said, um, the Headley, the, the Beowulf retelling only vaguely hits the fantasy mark. It's a sort of fabulous contemporary tale inspired by a work that has monsters in it, but it itself doesn't really. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have work like Nicola Griffith's Hild and her latest spear just won the Bradbury Award. She's an excellent writer of immersive history. She's able to give you a sense of what it would be like to live and think through the cosmology of a different culture. And so in Hild, this is inspired by a tiny scrap of history. We only have like a little half phrase about the original character, which has been expanded significantly by Nicola Griffith in her piece, which looks at this transitional period in uh, a pagan times just moving into Christianity. And as a result, does an excellent job of imagining a world of the weird and now I'm using the word weird very specifically because it comes from that era where you have a sense of place and your relationship with the world drawn from paganistic concepts of the world and then this notion of Christianity comes to you not the way that Christianity comes to us today but even things like a book are different obviously and so the ideas of Christianity are tr are introduced to your world uh, of a very different ideology, a very different cosmology, in some delicate ways that Nicola Griffith does a wonderful job of depicting. So it's also considered loosely fantasy because of the pagan elements, because of that different worldview. But again, this just shows how reductive we are in our commercial era, because this is the history of our species has been a very fluid integration of different concepts over different periods of time um, that from one era to the next may fall into and out of favor as being an accurate representation of the world we inhabit. And then suddenly everything else gets consigned to fantasy. It's very odd and funny. Okay, I hope I haven't forgotten too much there. Uh, I should also say, yeah, there, there's one work I'm going to talk about a little bit critically. Uh, and I'm with great love, uh, this one right here. So Ada Palmer's Too Like the Lightning. It is part of a series that imagines a far-flung future where French Enlightenment ideas have come back into vogue, fully into vogue. And one of the important things to keep in mind if you're going to decide to read this piece is that it is written like 17th century literature. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has read 17th century literature. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of play. Uh, imagine a time long before commercial genres where you do get to constantly write back on conventions as you were playing out conventions. People were playful in all eras. Wonderful stuff. And so that kind of voice comes through very clearly. It is it, it inspired very much by 17th century writing. It is also a, a book that leans on the great man theory of history, the idea of individuals moving history forward. Its plot line is structured around many different individuals moving history forward, and the idea of which individual is ultimately going to be on top of certain lists, uh, which one is going to be the most powerful in the middle of the fray. I. I did not like this work, um, but I admired the craft in it immensely. My reason for not liking it uh, had to do with the fact that it focuses a lot on showing how much the author knows about this time in history, and they know a lot. Ada Palmer, as a, a medieval scholar, absolutely, uh, Renaissance, um, 
focuses a lot on the Vatican, focuses a lot on um, those medieval to Renaissance histories, and there's a lot of love very clearly in um, the work that went into this, and I understand that. I geek out over things as well. Um, this is someone who knows full well a spectrum of centuries um, and makes manifest the wealth of that knowledge inside this piece. There's a, there's a thing that happens when you're in um, an academic field more than anything, which is that when you're writing a paper, usually your first draft of the paper is an info dump because you are still figuring out what you want to say and you're still trying to synthesize everything. And the idea with this writing is that eventually you want to get to the point where everyone can understand uh, very simply when you've synthesized the ideas well enough that everyone else can understand them too. And it's a good concept for writers to keep in mind in general. We get excited, we get passionate, we want to put lots of different Easter eggs in, we want to show off how much research we've done. And I mean, my first novel that I published this year was a deep, deep, deep dive into Soviet era history from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. I could spend a day looking up the exact currency that was available at a particular time in that history. Even though it was an alt history, I wanted to get those details right. But the idea is that you do kind of want them to fall into the background. You do want them to be a little bit more seamless. And this work does two things that are very complicated. I, I want to highlight that they're in intention. One, it is he very heavy on all of these details um, from a different century and all of these writers, uh, Rousseau, Hobbes, Voltaire, um, Carlyle, lots of names are mentioned and lots of with them lots of theories of the world and they're all at the same time talked about like everyone in this far-flung future would absolutely 100% know and care about and be directly and engaged with um, the ideas of the French Enlightenment, as if nothing else would have happened between them, as if our discourse wouldn't have carried forward. And so that's the, the problem that I had with the piece, is that there was such a wealth of knowledge from that era without any explanation as to why nothing from the subsequent centuries would have mattered, why suddenly everybody is suddenly an expert or is suddenly informed by all of those positions uh, from a different era entirely. And why it would happen to the flow of our discourse. So that was tricky. It is an extremely ambitious novel of ideas. It has some interesting concepts. Um, not necessarily always brought strongly to fruition, but ambition is great. So in terms of work that pushes the envelope, I mean, we have plenty of it in the genre. Lots of people engage with the past in, in different ways, and it exists on the page in our genre. I'm not entirely sure, again, why there's so much awkwardness about that. But I would have loved to have seen more of an understanding of why suddenly the great man of his theory of history um, research the way that it does in that series and why suddenly everybody cares that much about maintaining and returning to um, enlightenment era discourse and societal structures not quite fully fleshed out that leap but um, I, I, challenging and interesting and if you've read the source texts from those eras you might enjoy it um, and again good novel of ideas 17th century style of writing is quite fun, and kudos to Palmer for getting that voice down pat. Okay, yeah, I don't like being too critical on this. It's good to have challenging work in our genre. I will say, this was more my speed in terms of how to write about history and how to write about ideas and philosophy. This, I'm going to be a little bit glib here, this is our genre's version of Sophie's World. So Sophie's World is a little bit simple. I remember that when I first read it in high school, I'd already encountered most of the philosophical texts that it was inspired by. But it's such a lovely primer for folks who haven't necessarily gone through the core histories and the core philosophies to move through different ideas in the history of philosophy. And Anathem is exactly the same. Uh, Anathem allows the reader to move with the characters through an understanding concurrently of our history of philosophy of ideas, so many different philosophers over time, in conjunction with learning and moving through applied physics 
to a really important point um, as the mystery unfolds. It also imagines a fantastic world where you can go into scholastic solitude in these monasteries of either a year of solitude, 10 years of solitude, 100 years, and every now and then there's one monastery that only opens every thousand years. And uh, so Anathem is quite lovely in its world building, uh, fantastical in its idea of a society that actually focuses on um, making more time for thoughtful discourse. But what I like about it is that as it goes through histories of philosophy, it really allows the reader to come along and learn with the, the characters, uh, which is a much more, I think, engaging and accessible way into a lot of the material. And it has a very pleasing payoff, so I won't spoil more. Then, of course, there's the work that was 100% used as a comp for mine, because again, there is lots of classic literature that has been used to inform science fiction. You've probably been wondering why I haven't mentioned Dan Simmons' Hyperion yet, because I wanted to save it, obviously. But Hyperion is based on Chaucer. <laughs> based on the Canterbury Tales. Can you imagine? I don't know how many of you have read the Canterbury Tales. You probably know of the wife of Bath. Everyone loves the story about a woman tricking a man into kissing her ass, literally. <laughs> um, but there are other beautiful and very fascinating stories. It's wonderful. The important part, too, is that um, Chaucer is also in conversation with other literature. He is in uh, relation. He is in conversation with Decameron as well as other narratives of the time. Some of his stories are lifted very much, were inspired by the Decameron. So everyone is building on people who come before. Um, you get some really fascinating pieces. If you haven't read the Franklin's Tale, for instance, I highly recommend anybody who thinks that gender discourse is new and the idea of equality between the sexes is a new concept, go back and read the Franklin's tale. Uh, wonderful stuff. So how does, how does Dan Simmons turn this into sci-fi? Well, he imagines a voyage where a, a motley crew of characters are stuck together uh, on a long journey to a space that is supposed to hold some important answers for them all. They've been called to this space for many different reasons, they have many different journeys, and each night on their voyage, a different one takes their turn telling the story, a story, which happens to be the, their story of, of why, why they are there, what's happened to them in their lives. And as these stories unfold, beautiful connections start to emerge, quite fascinating. And some of the stories are gripping, haunting, terrifying. Other ones have a sort of detective edge, romantic. They've got a full range, just like uh, in the Canterbury Tales. Everyone's life path has many different dimensions, but they all end in Hyperion. So it's a series, and it's, it's quite well done. What it's done is it's taken a structure that we don't often find in contemporary writing, which is the idea of holding different voices in tension, holding different stories in tension against one another, and carrying that mode forward because it's a really potent way of telling a story. So, quite useful. The final piece that I'm going to talk about today, and thank you for your patience, I know this is a longer one, is one that might have slipped your notice and it shouldn't have. Frankenstein in Baghdad, oh my goodness. Um, I'm going to probably mess up this last name because I've heard it said a few different ways. So I'm not sure which is the actual pronunciation, but it's Ahmed Sadawi, um, Sadawi, I think. But Frankenstein in Baghdad is, I think, the best encapsulation of why we bring literature forward. Obviously, it is inspired by Frankenstein. Uh, but at the Baghdad part is really important. It's set in a U.S.-occupied Iraq and it imagines a main character who, living in the trauma of constant war, just in a regular, regular neighborhood where people are struggling to get by day by day, going crazy in their own ways, dealing with trauma in their own ways. This one person is trying to find enough body parts from all of the dead, from this wanton violence all around to be able to stitch them together to make a body that can be buried and the body comes to life. And I won't go further into it than that except to say that the original had very clear anxieties related to its time, 
the idea of the audacity of scientific creation, the idea of the monstrosity of man in not caring for their creation. All of those ideas carry forward so obviously when you read this text into the context of current battlefields. This is obviously set in Iraq, but the same would be true for Ukraine right now, many other worldly wars. This is a beautiful, powerful reminder that this is not the first time we have been down these paths. And I think one of the most important reasons to continue to hold our literature in science fiction and fantasy, as well as in mainstream fiction, in conversation, open conversation with the past, is because we as human beings have not much changed and there is strength to be found in remembering how much has not changed, that the crises and questions of our age have been dealt with before. Which is why I also don't really think of Children of Doro as a remediation of um, the Brothers Karamazov, although I, I will say, I will say, I've mentioned this before, that Smerdikov being a, uh, a disabled bastard child of a, uh, I, I hesitate to put too strong a label, on the mother who is mute and is perceived to be a very simple person um, and is very much assaulted by, uh, by the, the father and the family. Um, I do change that character because I don't want to carry forward a lot of those inappropriate stigmas while still honoring the spirit of the character and, and what they serve in the text and the mother too. Um, so my Desma and my Reek have different origins and different attitudes. But other than that, I'm not trying to remediate. I'm not trying to invert the original story. I'm carrying forward a conversation that meant a lot to me. Um, the Brothers Kamenzov is my, it is the most important book probably that I have ever read. Um, at the same time, it didn't reflect my way of moving through the world because my humanism is differently informed than Dostoevsky's and as a result I carried the conversation forward by writing something that was a little bit truer to me. That's it. So there are lots of reasons we engage with literature. Right now again I am I'm now starting my work on Thucydides in space. I put aside my draft whew, for three months and I'm now diving back in and that one's going to be interesting. Um, so I am not rewriting the Peloponnesian War, but I'm deeply informed by the conversations there because nothing has changed. This is a war that happened 2,400 years ago and human behavior has not changed. So I, I will talk more about that in other episodes. For this one, I really just wanted to give you a bit of a tour, not only of the wealth of science fiction and fantasy that has been informed by classic literature, philosophy, and history, but also the problems with a lot of Western publishing culture around it, um, the anxieties of Western publishing culture that make it difficult right now for us to connect as much with our past as we can and should and do. I, I do think that the publishing scene is a little bit cynical and a little bit insulting when it suggests that people can't handle these kinds of works because I definitely see that people are hungry for them and writers are keen to be sharing them. So. Let's do what we can. Let's lean into as much of the work that we see in conversation with work that came before, and hopefully we can turn the tide. Okay, I have taken up a lot of your time today. Thank you so very much. Apologies again for the background noise. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Look at me doing my little promotion thing, but mostly in the comments, tell me about a work that resonated with you that also either uh, was inspired by something in the past or invoked interesting philosophical ideas for you. I'd love to hear about them. Cheers and have yourselves a wonderful day.